Welcome to Inspirational Transformational TV Show. Amy Whitney here today with my very special guest, Robert Moore. Robert is an author and he is an inspiration. I'm not sure if I have actually met anybody with a greater story of transformation than what Robert has. His debut book, There's More to Life, tells his tale, his journey through life and the incredible transformation that he has gone through from serious addiction to almost dying three times to being homeless to the point he's at today which is a leader in the community helping others a, a, a amazing student of life and just an absolute blessing to be around he has a gentle gentle nature a warm smile and he just embraces you with the love that he has for his new life so sit back strap yourself in because you're not going to believe the story that robert's going to share with you today enjoy the show robert moore thank you so much for joining inspirational transformational tv show thank you for having me my pleasure so i'm going to launch right in to um basically what I found to be a theme in your, your new book you've just released, mm -hmm. um, and that was the emotion of anger. You, you start in your book at a, at a very young age expressing anger. Where did that come from? I do believe that uh, through a divorce, my parents' divorce, I think maybe I was affected by that, and I was suppressing all the feelings. And then when the stepmom came in, what happened was, I think maybe I was scared to tell them what was going on with myself because of everything that was going on at the time. So I just kept suppressing, 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 and became a time bomb. When I released it, then I released it right at the time. Yes. So you spent, from an early age, getting into fights, and more importantly, on the inside, feeling angry. Yeah, I, was, I felt really lost. Yeah. I felt like I, there was nobody there for me. So, will you take us on a bit of a journey of your story from that point? Was it the anger that was the catalyst that led you, eventually it led you into drinking and drugs, is that right? Yeah, the heavy addictions, yes. Um, I do believe, due to the fact of me suppressing and, and didn't know how to express myself, yes. what happened was when I finally saw other people drinking and seeing them, the mess of alcohol, the mess, you know what I mean? Yes. Once I seen the midst of that alcohol, everybody having a good time and having a barbecue, everybody laughing, I just say, well, maybe I'll guzzle one down. And I had that different feeling all of a sudden. When I had that different feeling, it was like I could be somebody, you know? And then all of a sudden, my dad didn't really notice at first, but he had noticed his beer was missing. <laughs> right. So then uh, he did notice I was acting a bit different as being more expressive, mm -hmm. but more angrier at them and telling them, you know, things that they'd never heard before. Right. You know, like, more more or less, no, yes, no. Right? When they'd ask me something, I'd mouth back. Yes. That wasn't the right thing, right? So. So it started, at what age you started to drink? I started drinking roughly around 13. I had my first beer. And that was, and it was, did you know at the time that you were using as a medication in a way for your emotions? No, I just couldn't figure out why everybody else was so happy while drinking and stuff. Right. And all of a sudden I drink, uh, it was a stubby back then. Yes. It was OV. You know, <laughs> the stuff tastes like sandpaper, honest to God. Yes. But I did drink it and I, when I felt something different, then I realized that there's a way of getting out of me. Mm. When there was a way of getting out of me, and I figured, well, I don't have to deal with my emotions. Yes. You know, I could just deal with this and, and I could slide by certain things. So then it became a behavior of I'd steal to mm -hmm. get other things like cigarettes. I started cigarettes back then too because I was cool, you know. Yes. And, and actually this area right here is where I started all this stuff. Yes. And what area are we in? In Mississauga, Clarkson, Ontario. Beautiful. Yeah. And um, now t take us down the road of addiction. 
so at 13 you just started to have some drinks. How did it escalate? Like I read your, your beautiful autobiography, it's mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. Um, so I don't want to give too much of that away, but um, what I want to know is how did you progress from having a few drinks at 13 to the point you actually do get to in your journey in life? Basically, in the community, I, I guess I seeked out the people that were getting the attention too, because I wasn't getting enough attention at home. Right. So I'd seek out in the community for people that were getting attention. And there was a lot of people in fights, gangs, and everything else that people were scared of. So okay. if I got in with, with them, people would listen to me. Right. And I wouldn't be in trouble. Right. Little I knew that there was police backing those guys up and yeah. I'd get in trouble that way, right? Yeah. But every time I hung around these people, I felt inferior, I felt invincible. Right. Right. So it, it became my friends, oh, let's go have a few beers. Right. We'd pay another person to go in and buy us a few more beers or we'd steal it off our parents, mm. you know, or you know, whatever it may be to, to get it. So the thought process in those early days, were you, did you have aspirations, did you have hopes, were you thinking, oh, in a few years I'll study to be a dentist, or, or were I you I had just... dreams of just being somebody, I right. don't know who, I don't think. Yeah. Because back then when I was like 13, 14, 15 years old, I was on the midst of being kicked out of school, and as a matter of fact, at 15, I did get kicked out of school and asked not to go back. Okay. That was in Flusherton, where my parents moved from here and they bought a house up there. Okay. But at, back then, I mean, we all have hopes of being somebody. Yeah. To be honest with you, I don't know what it was. I dreamt a lot when I was on the booze, right? Yes. You know, wishful thinking. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe the lottery ticket, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't a clue. So it, so your, your addiction, uh, it progressed into heavier drugs? Yeah, actually, there it, it wasn't much I didn't do. I'll right. be honest with you, there was, it went right from uh, the booze, went right into, I tried smoking weed, and then from there I went to barbiturates, which are pills, uh, drugstores, codeine, uh, and then went, went from there, I went right up to the heavy stuff, right to the cocaine, and, and then I went from there, and it was, wasn't just snorting, it wasn't just doing crack cocaine, but I was banging it too at the time. What is banging it mean? Which means you put it in a needle syringe, mm -hmm. and you just put it in your vein and let it go. And this would have been around, no, this would have been after the AIDS, uh, sort of, 80s, 1980s were the AIDS, the big AIDS time, was well, it? Well, the biggest turnaround when the, into the drugs were, um, my common law wife died. Okay. She died giving birth to my son, right, which is a big part of this book, and uh, I won't give too much away of that, but I'll, I'll just, you know, it affected me emotionally. I didn't know how to affect with my emotions. Yes. So when I had an emotion, at that time I ran to the boobs. Okay. So it got a little deeper, and the, the lady I next met up with that kind of helped me through things because it was a drinking partner, she was doing drugs. Okay. And that's how I got led into the drugs. Okay. And it, it just, a higher escape. Right. And from there, would you say your life spiraled out of control? It definitely took a twist. It definitely took a twist. Yeah. Because I got to meet the first, uh, when I was 18 years old, I actually got to meet the inside of a jail. Okay. And that became some friends. You know, I so thought we're friends back then. Mm -hmm. It kept going on and on and on for several years of my life. But in the book, it'll explain to you about 16 years in the jail before I had whatever I could have in order to come this far. And you were homeless? I was homeless for about seven years, yeah. I, would, I would, wouldn't hesitate to if it was snowing out, I'd, I'd do whatever I got to do to keep warm. I'd steal clothing from mm -hmm. people when they're doing their laundry. Mm -hmm. I'd wrap snow around me just to keep warm. Um, but it wouldn't be too far from a beer store. I've always noticed that. Interesting. <laughs> so what, what was the thought process when you were looking at how you were living at that point when you were addicted to different drugs, addicted to alcohol, on the street? What was going through your mind? Back then, when I, actually, when I, I used to drink a lot in the bush. Okay. The only time I would actually go into bars when I'd uh, lie to people to get more booze, and I didn't have the money for it. So, mm. um, when I'd sit in the bush with, I usually sit with four or five different people. Everybody started deteriorating after a while. Everybody, you know, either dying, going to jail, or just not wanting to be around me, mm -hmm. because my anger started showing more and more. 
mm -hmm. because I was at that point where I could only get so high. And I guess I was taking out all my frustrations out on people while drinking and drugging. Right. So nobody really wanted to be around me at all. Right. And you've almost died, haven't you? I almost died a few times. Right. I got into a few fights, uh, once with a 12-inch blade that went from, from here to here on my body. And it just so happens I'm lucky to be alive over that. It was over stupidity, too. And the thought process when you're, you wake up in emergency and you realize, you know, you've almost died, was that the point that made you turn your life around? No. Believe it or not, that wasn't the point. Um, I wish I could say it was, but it, it was a little bit more than that. It was, it was a start of one, I guess. But I can honestly say, when I woke up, I was scared. I didn't know where I was. And when I started feeling a little better and I actually got charges on me, I was looking at 12 years in jail. That didn't even slow me down. Because I went outside, um, while in the hospital at the time, with 44 staples in my chest. And I still had a friend come over and bring a big bottle of beer and we drank it. Mm. And then I started doing cocaine that day too, while on the other drugs for the hospital. Unbelievable. So, what was your point? What was your point when you said, I've had enough? When, when I finally said I had enough, it was emotional numb. I was totally numb. I couldn't identify any emotion. Anybody that come near me, I didn't like. I, I just started hating people. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was really weird because I was walking down the street in Brampton, Ontario. I was, I was living on the street. I wanted to go to a detox one more time. And I finally decided, well, let's go to the detox. And, and I phoned the detox up and I said, okay, go to the hospital first because you need to get on some volume first. We know the way it is when you come off the boots. I started feeling aches and pains, seeing bugs and everything else, a lot of hallucinations, mm. big time. <clears throat> I was using so much, I wasn't just drinking alcohol though, it was rubbing alcohol and I mean you name anything with alcohol and I drank it, mouthwash, yeah. Chinese cup and wine. It was very salty Chinese cup and wine, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> so it wasn't any specific point in your life that, that led you to detox and turn your life around. It was just, you, you just hit the limit with it. When the day that I actually went in there, um, I was actually debating on either going to have another beer with a friend of mine before going into that uh, hospital before detox because they're called for the crisis bed, or um, just going into the hospital. and. When I was talking to myself, debating that out loud, I turned around, I, I turned around and saw this little girl and she pointed at me and said, Mommy, she, he needs help. And at that moment there, I didn't clue in, but two minutes after that, I said, wait a minute, she just said, I need help, I must be doing something wrong here. I turned around and that little girl wasn't around no more, so I don't know where she went. And it must have been a sign from somewhere, because I asked the lady, I said, ma'am, can you tell me where the little girl was? And she says, I don't have a little girl. So, I mean, I, I can't explain it. <laughs> I know at the time I needed some help, but I didn't know how bad it was. Mm -hmm. So that was a sign right there that I, I'd get inside. So I actually walked right into the hospital and said, I'm here. I called for an appointment and, yeah, we've been waiting for you, they said. <laughs> Can you take us through the experience of detoxification? I sure can. Um, we first go in. They question you how much you're using and what's all in your system because they need to know um, what they're in for, right? Mm -hmm. And they ask how bad you normally come off uh, the booze or the drugs or the barbiturates or whatever else that you can put in your body at the time. It's a long process, that part, but then they put you in this thing called a bubble. It's observation for three days. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's where uh, a lot of people do hallucinations. Um, people throw up all the time because they're, you know, they're coming off a lot of stuff. Yeah. You got the shower there if you need to, the bathroom's there, but you also got about seven other people going through the same thing. So they, they usually give you the, one of those little milkshakes to help mm -hmm. you out mm -hmm. with your vitamins and everything else because you can't eat, you can't put things down. So I mean, and, and you can't even go outside that room. You have to stay there. And. When you were going through, say, those three days of heavy detox, what was it that, that kept you there? 
I was too sick to move. Right. Too sick to get up. If someone would have walked in and had a case of beer, it would have took me about three hours, and I would have been okay. I would have walked out. Right. And all I could think about is, uh, is how do we get out of this mess? And and at that time, I, I honestly said, if there's a guy out there, help me, because I I don't know what to do here. I, I can't stand the pain. Yes. And, and what I'm going through, I was hallucinating and seeing things, and I couldn't sleep. And when I did sleep, it was like far and few between yeah. an hour here, an hour there, but your just body's all achy. And how many years ago was that? Right now, I'm clean and sober almost, almost six years. So September 5th, 2005, I walked in the doors at the detox. Congratulations. Thank you. And in that time, like, so you were basically an addict for 16 years, is that right? 16 to 18, yeah. And and during that time, your accomplishments amounted to not much. But in the past six years, do you want to list off some of the, the things? Last six years, <laughs> um, clean and sober. When I was three three and a half months clean and sober, I had a, a fellow come up to me. I started going to a uh, twelve step meetings, and when while well at the twelve step meetings, there's always someone that can help coach you, mm -hmm. help guide you like a sponsor, right? So. I didn't have one at that time. I was, you know, I guess I was sponsoring me, the ism part of the alcohol, right? Yes. And uh, he, he, this one guy comes up to me and says, who's sponsoring you? And I said, what do you mean who's sponsoring me? Now, I was very rough around the edges. I did not how to live sober in sobriety or anything, or how to live in the community without the booze or the drugs. Well, lying, whatever I had to do, right? Okay. And this guy, he was actually... Uh, an ex biker. Okay. And he says to me, Who who's sponsoring you? And I said, I don't know what you mean. And he says, Knock off the tough guy act. I'm sponsoring you now. You report to me. And I said, Yikes. <laughs> 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 we almost went around back a few times because I was I was a fighter. Right. right. And I hated fighting but I hated hurting people. But I didn't like the way I felt, so I fought to get out of my own skin too. That became an addiction. Really? Obviously, yeah. Because if I didn't have the booze, what was I doing, right? So you mentioned that when you were sober, you didn't know how to interact or how to feel. What was the process with moving back into society? I went to a treatment center. Okay. At that treatment center, I spent uh, almost four months. All right. And while at the treatment center, they took me through different emotions. What they basically did was strip my emotions to nil. Uh -huh. So I'm just an empty shell with no emotions. Because I couldn't identify them anyway, so why not strip them? Okay. So what they did was they built them up one by one and trying to get me to live with the process of this and it was not easy. Yeah. I was angry at the same time I was willing to do the steps which are a 12 step program, right? Yes. And I kept saying to the one guy that said he was going to sponsor me, I said, I don't understand why I can't stay sober. And he says, how many steps have you done before? And I said, I've done one, two and three. And he says, why don't you try doing number four, move on. Otherwise, that's a moral inventory of herself, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess that feared me because I didn't know what lies ahead. Mm -hmm. And number five is actually when you talk to another person about what you've been through in that fourth. Right. So it's very emotional, and it's almost like you go through an emotional hangover before you get better. Interesting. Yeah. So the 12 step program, it actually. It, it, it worked for you and you're still a member and that's oh yeah that's I, your I sponsor I speak and I help out I even actually today I have a pass I can go into uh, the jail up north which is a federal jail yes. and I can talk to other people about uh, certain things too because I've achieved so much wow and and I, I cut you off because we we're talking about the things you have achieved in the past five years mm -hmm. because it's just it's absolutely beautiful so do you want to share some of your highlights um I'm the first in Georgian college's history to ever establish an award while going to school. Mm -hmm. And I did that by building a basement apartment. Um, at the same time going to school, doing placement, right in the book. Beautiful. You know, and I was keeping busy, but I wanted to do something to get back to the community, especially the one that helped me out. Yes. And that's up in Arroyo, Ontario, right where I live. Mm -hmm. So I mean, so I help out them, and then next thing you know, um, some more of my achievements, I got the Lieutenant Governor's Community Volunteer Award for helping other students out. Mm -hmm. um, I did my grade 12, yeah. I went through and I got drug and alcohol counseling diploma. 
And I also went through, uh, I got social service worker diploma through Georgia College. Wow. And today I'm a second year student at uh, the honors role of uh, social work at Lakehead University in Arroyo. I just want to start clapping. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also, my goal is to establish another award at Lakehead University this year. Amazing. And that's what I'm doing next month. Next month I'll be having a yard sale with donations and everything from the community. Yes. And I'm going to, once that's all sold, a thousand dollars, that money, whatever it doesn't make a thousand, I'll put in the rest. And that will make it an award by, by September. Congratulations. And the motivation for writing the book, because I would assume like the content of that book, as I said to you off camera, was just so emotional and so raw to read. So it would take a certain level to be able to expose yourself like that. What was the motivation? You know what, I was sitting there doing a motivational speaking one time because I was asked by the Board of Education. Um, there was a lady that was actually inspired by how I dealt with things and she saw when I graduated the Learning Center in mm -hmm. She was just so overwhelmed with how I'm doing with things, like, wow, how do you do this? Yes. So I said, well, let me do a speech, you know? Mm -hmm. Get me to do one speech and maybe you'll listen, you'll hear it. Yes. It's a way of sharing. I'm all about helping other people out, but I do not forget how to, how to defuse myself. Yes. Like I go and talk to someone else and make sure I can digest things right. in a proper manner now. Like I don't overwhelm myself yes. and, and get too much on my plate. Um, I always have someone I go to talk to and make sure that I can, you know, digest everything properly. Is that a key factor in um, staying clean and sober, is the communication and the... the yeah, you, because the people that are helping me out have already been there. They've yeah. already been down the lies, the cheating, the stealing, yes. and they've already been down the road that don't work. Yes. Right? So, if it's not going to work for many of others, I can't see it working for me. I can't be the first on that one. Yes. You know, it's just it's part of the rules. <laughs> So tell us a bit about your motivation of speaking. You actually go to, to youth centers and schools? I, I do go to, uh, yes, I, up on a way I've talked to uh, adult learning centers, mm -hmm. right? And I go in there and I, I just basically talk to them about my emotional side of things about going back to school. Mm -hmm. I went back to school at 32. Nice. Right? And it was a weird feeling, especially three months sober. No, nope, pardon me, I was six months sober. Yes. And the worst part is you're in class with people that are, your children's age, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. And it, they're all talking about what a big party they had, and you're only six months clean, and you're, as long as you don't fall into that, you know, like, I call it war stories. Right. All, you know, all the things in my past is war stories. It made me feel good because I wanted to do this and mm. show off and be mm. somebody, mm. but neglecting the person I wanted to be in the first place, or had to be, or guided to be, mm. you know? And... Do you feel, I love the story about the, the little girl that you saw at that pivotal moment in your life, um, and you tell a story in the book about when you quit smoking, um, mm. which I love, it's my favorite story. Um, do you feel like there's divine intervention in your life because you had a greater purpose? I feel something definitely happened. Um, someone touched me somewhere down the line. Mm -hmm. um, it could have been 20 years ago they touched me and just maybe I just woke up from it, right? It's hard to say. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of death in my, in my, my past. You know, my, my older brother Tom died. My cousin Tim died. Right? My wife died. Um, and my uncle died and his girlfriend. There was a lot of death there. And there was a lot to do with booze and drugs and mm. lack of communication somewhere, obviously, right? Yeah. Quitting smoking, though, was a... That was a chore. But, uh, it surprised <laughs> me because it was one of the, the highlights in your book was like the description of how difficult that was when you had all these other addictions that I was, yeah, you know. That was one of the worst ones. Honestly, God, smoking, believe it or not, I was rushed to the hospital twice. I almost OD'd on Witra. I'd never even heard of it until that day. What? Yeah, I almost OD'd on Witra. So when I was going through, uh, I was actually doing my exams that week for Witra. I got 100% on it because I, I learned <laughs> you, you what it. was it about. I learned what it was about and I learned that, you know, what the dipple means and everything else. you got to flush them out and yes. there's a barrier and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. I learned how to really focus on neurotransmitters and yes. it was interesting. I can imagine. 
And um, what was your biggest inspiration through all this? I'm a goal seeker. Mm -hmm. I'm a big time goal seeker. If at very very first it was half a day at a time, right. I'd see if I can go half a day without thinking of either a cigarette, booze, or drugs, or or how to lie or cheat. Right. right? Um, I did a lot of journals, and through the journals, when actually the time when I was doing motivational speaking, I was still doing journal right afterwards, right? Because I wanted to write down how I was feeling, so I didn't get overwhelmed and show too much and didn't know how that react. Yes. So I wanted to write it down so I knew how to react. Because I know when you put something on paper, you take ownership of it. Okay. I've learned that a long time ago. And then, then it's okay to share with people. Right. Right? The reason why I wrote this book is to help those who can't help themselves or can't see themselves needing the help. Maybe they can feel they need it after they read the book. Do you have any suggestions for um, parents who have... 12, 13 year old children and they can start to see symptoms like what you described, beer is missing, behavior changing. Do you have any advice or suggestions for parents in that situation? See, the, the thing is obviously the child is in need of some kind of sort of either lovings or attention of some sort. See, I also worked at the Youth, youth Drop-In Center in Aurora as a placement. Okay. When I did that on placement, I've learned a lot while I was there. Mm -hmm. I learned that children not only do things, like the youth children, not only do things because they want attention though, they do it because they want to hang in or fit, fit in with certain people. Right. So if they're actually seeing a problematic with this, you know, the booze or drugs and everything else, they should sit down and talk with someone. But don't just do it amongst themselves, Right. maybe with a professional. Okay. You know, like someone that deals with it. It, it. it could be mental crisis, could be not. Yes. You know, like concurrent disorder is a big thing now. What, what disorder? Concurrent disorder. Concurrent disorder is a mental stability with uh, alcohol or, or some other kind of addiction. I don't, even, I don't know what you mean by mental stability. Like. You can have uh, mental health. Right. Right. Or you can just have, say you have learning disorders, right. you know, or something like that. See, I have a learning disorder. Nobody ever knew it. Right. But I knew it. You you could sense it. I had a feeling I was having troubles all all along with reading and writing and everything else. Right. And then I was told I'd never pass college. And look at you now. I I got you know what when I when I left college and went into university, they gave me my first year. I was I was okay. Really? Yeah. I, I qualified for my first year off. Beautiful. And that was like wow. Like we mean I can't do this. Amazing. People tell me I can't do things. That's why I put little goals into a, a bigger goal. Beautiful. And the friends and your associates from the book, um, like a lot of them are going down the road with you. Have you had to move away from your past life completely? Like basically let go of some family members and friends? Uh, that's true. Uh, well, in the book, it, it, it's got 12 different testimonials of other people, and I did not change any of them. I might fix a little spelling in there for them. <laughs> <laughs> but I also had three editors for the book, too. Wonderful. Um, some of the family members are alcoholics. Uh, my Uncle Pat, for instance, uh, I don't think he'll ever change. He's not doing well with his health right now. And fortunately, nothing I can do. Mm. If you don't want it, then I can't do nothing. There's other people. I, I say people, places, and things. People I hung around with, there's a lot of them that are dying off, going to jail, no longer around, nobody knows where they are. The places, the place, I can't go sit in a bush with, you know, without thinking about having a, a wobbly pop, I'd call it, right? Yeah. You know, or, or things, things I did before as a trigger. I, I have to avoid things like that. And your goals and aspirations, I know you're going to set up another, is it called a fund or um, what are you setting up at Lakehead? The I, yeah, I'm going to set up another award. Award. In my own name, yeah. Any, and when you graduate, are you practicing something or what's your... Actually, before I graduate, I'm going to be doing something a little further because by the end of this year, um, considering I've already got a couple of diplomas, I'm going to, I'm going to start working with the, the youth committee probably up in Aurelia. Great. And maybe do like a crisis thing that I go to their house and deal with them, as long as things are in safe for us when we walk in. Yes. Like we can't walk into something that's not safe. There'd be two of us doing it at once. Yes. Um, this good friend of mine, she's gone through school and doing the exact same thing I'm doing too. 
Great. Yeah. And um, the youth must receive you well because you've been there. They must well, I've also it. I've also done uh, a lot with the youth too in the community up there. Yes. Um, I'm getting well known up there. I've just got nominated for the Order of Arroyo Award. Wow, well, yeah, I never won, but I, I got nominated. No, congratulations. You know, like that's an honor. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. When you look at your life today compared to, say, 10 years ago, um, is it completely beyond your wildest dreams, or did you know that in it, within yourself you had it within you? I didn't know I had it in, within me, no. But I'll tell you right now, every day that goes on, I, I, I surprise myself. Yeah. Because... I mean, my book, for instance, I mean, I never thought I could imagine that. I had a hope and a dream of doing it. But one thing I will say, and I tell a lot of people when I do motivational speaking, if someone was holding me underwater, what would I be wishing for? My air, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if I wanted my dreams to come through as bad as I wanted that air, I will put it from my head to my heart and make it happen. Beautiful. And it's happened just that way. So with the book, it's um, it's going into chapters at Yorkdale, is that uh, right? Got you beat. I just I was there yesterday, as a matter of fact. Yes. I just signed the contract. Beautiful. Uh, chapters uh, in the go, Yorkdale Mall. Beautiful. It's uh, I got fifty of them sitting there on stock right now. Beautiful. That must feel amazing. And you're doing a book signing? I'm doing a book signing. I just had one today. Yes. Right, and I'm also doing one uh, in Arroyo. Um, May, May 7th, uh -huh. I'm doing one. There's flyers and everything else, plus on my website it's listed. I'm also doing one at the end of those chapters, May 28th, the day before my birthday. Oh, wonderful. What a treat. What a feeling that is. That's, That's been my dream. Beautiful. I'm in Barnes & Noble right now, too, and everything. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And your, your, your words of wisdom, if you had any message from everything that you have learned, what would... Um, could you summarize it into some words of wisdom? Mm -hmm. Sure, you could. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, uh, doing it ourselves without asking for help is just selfishness. Because of the fact of if we're looking at doing something, achieving a tiny little goal, you always need guidance. Mm -hmm. What might work for others may not work for another, right? But the thing is, if we're doing it alone, where are we going to lead? There's nobody, there's nobody ahead of us to show us the way. You know what? I've always noticed while looking in school and all through my life, there's always someone watching us. It don't matter what you're doing, there's always someone watching you. And they're admiring how you're doing things, don't matter if it's for the good or bad. Mm -hmm. Right now, I got people got me on a pedestal and I said, don't, because I could easily fall down and hurt you. Mm -hmm. I could wish your dreams could not come true because of it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if they want guidance and that, I don't mind if people email me or nothing. They mm -hmm. want guidance. I did have a website where I was sponsoring people through the States. Right. And that used to be letstalkaddictions.com. Right. But I've closed that down because I was just overwhelmed with so many things at once. Yes. But I have this website now. Yes. Right? That went through the book. Plus, at the end of the book, I have an email address where people can email me. Yes. You know. Beautiful. So you open yourself to always support. Uh, well, one person out of 50. If I help one person out of 50, that's my goal. Beautiful. Oh, it's not a high expectation. Beautiful. If more get helped out, so be it. <laughs> I love it. And on that note, thank you so much. Thank you. Robert, thank you so much for your time today. It was such an honor to meet you, to be in your presence, to see your amazing smile and know that you are living the life you're born to live now. You're helping others. You've written a really beautiful book that's going to change lives. And there's just no stopping you. You're on such a great path now. And like I said, it's such an honor to know you. Many blessings and much love. Woo